four years ago, on March 12th, Reverend Lynn and I, after communicating with the Board of Trustees and our staff, made the decision to close the church buildings due to this strange and scary coronavirus, which had finally reached Union College in Albany. When I think about change, I often think about this cataclysmic experience. Most of us didn't know anything except that lots of people were getting sick, going to the hospital, and many, so very many, were dying. Most of us were afraid, at least at first. Science and the medical establishments all over the world were having a hard time understanding how this virus worked. Little did we know in March of 2020 just how much fear and change a microscopic entity would exact on the whole world. There were small changes we all made and there were huge ones. Now each of us might categorize those changes differently <laughs> depending on how those changes impacted our lives. Some of the changes were more temporary for most of us as scientists learned more. Does anyone still wash or wipe down all of your groceries between, before you bring them into the house? <laughs> but it seemed like a good idea at the time as we didn't know. But now we know, and so we do other things to protect each other. Greek philosopher Heraclitus, or Heraclitus, if you are Greek, there's lots of different pronunciations on the web, but most of us decide it's Heraclitus, is credited with the idea that change is the only constant. And dang, was change constant throughout 2020 and beyond. And many of those changes were motivated in part by fear. Fear of getting sick. Fear of one another's breath. Fear of dying. The shape and texture of those fears changed over the many months and new ones were added. Fear of the unknown. Fear of long COVID. Fear of isolation, fear of the next variant. Many of us experienced individual as well as communal layers of trauma. And this is further complicated because while we all lived in the same world that had a global pandemic, we did not all experience the same impacts of the radical and rapid changes that occurred. Many of us have gone back to whatever was in the before times. But some of us have had our lives permanently changed, or at least permanently to this point. When I was younger, I observed that a lot of people my parents' or grandparents' age would be able to tell you exactly where they were and what they were doing in 1963 when they heard that President Kennedy had been assassinated or Dr. King in 1968. Many can tell you what they were doing when they learned about the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion in 1986, or the tragic events of Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, or the horrific events, the riots of January 6th, 2021 at the US Capitol. When traumatic events happen, we humans have a variety of ways of dealing including not dealing with them. Some would rather just forget the whole thing. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Let's just move on. But experts in healing trauma actually recommend the opposite. They say it is important to talk about it, to process it with other people who've experienced it, or seek out a therapist or a support group to be willing to face it. And we don't need to do that alone. That's why I name this anniversary today. That we might take stock of where we've been and where we are now and notice what's changed. Notice what lingers. Notice what we've let go of. Because a lot of that stuff still lives in our bodies. 
still lives in our hearts. Because memories live in our minds and our bodies, especially in the event of a challenging or traumatic event. And we carry these memories with us for varying lengths of time. And sometimes the losses lodge in us. And sometimes we find ways towards healing. We need not be afraid to remember. To remember together. I find this poem by Stanley Kunitz a touching way of naming this complexity of our lives. This poem was published when he was 73, and I imagine at different points of his life, just as in different points of my life, something different speaks to me each time I read this poem. It's called The Layers. I have walked through many lives, some of them my own, and I am not who I was. Though some principle of being abides, from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind as I am compelled to look before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which scavenger angels wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself a tribe out of my true affections, and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feasts of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn, I turn, exulting somewhat with my will intact to go wherever I need to go, and every stone on the road precious to me. In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through the wreckage, a nimbus-clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not in the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. That Greek philosopher Herac Heraclitus said, on those stepping into rivers, staying the same, other and other waters flow. The idea that we never step into the same river twice is sort of credited in this, his direction. And perhaps you know, but it was new to me, that there's an internet encyclopedia of philosophy. It's a really cool, free, online, peer-reviewed, academic resource about all kinds of philosophy. There, they interpret this Heraclitus quote to mean and to name that there is an antithesis between same and other. The sentence says that different waters flow in rivers staying the same. In other words, though the waters are always changing, the rivers stay the same. Indeed, it must be precisely because the waters are always changing that there are rivers at all, rather than lakes or ponds. The message is that rivers can stay the same over time, even though, or indeed because, the waters change. The point then is not that everything is changing, but that the fact that some things change makes possible the continued existence of other things. Perhaps more generally, the change in elements or constituents supports the constancy of higher level structures. I love philosophy stuff like this. Maybe not everything changes, but some things change. And the fact that they change help other things exist at all. Super cool. This year, we have been reviewing the proposed changes to the Article 2 of the Unitarian Universalist Association's bylaws. I know, we're going to keep visiting it all year long. It's okay. Because there's lots to look at, lots to consider, lots to think about. These are big changes that are being suggested. 
For several decades, we have been guided by principles and sources, and the Article II Study Commission was charged with reviewing the current version and making recommendations for changes. They have recommended removing the principles and sources from the bylaws and instead articulate a set of values. Each month this year, we have been exploring one or two of the values statements. Now, the format of the proposed language is to name the value, to express a statement of what is meant by that value, and then there's a statement of covenant. Because we have this value, we therefore covenant to be a particular way with one another. This month, we explore transformation. Article 2 folks are proposing the language that transformation means we adapt to the changing world. We covenant to collectively transform and grow spiritually and ethically. Openness to change is fundamental to our Unitarian and Universalist heritages, never complete and never perfect. Last Sunday, and also at Wonderful Wednesday this week, we explored some of the ways our Universalist, our Unitarian, and our Unitarian Universalist heritages have changed over time, which is what makes us a living tradition. The river of Unitarian Universalism exists because of the changing waters. Now, the Commission doesn't just think that collective transformation is a good idea. They want us to actively promise and practice growing spiritually and ethically. If change is coming, what do we need to imagine? When I was a kid, I had a lot of fears, like many of us, some rational, some irrational. And one of the biggest fears I had was of aliens. I would uh, lie awake in my bed at night looking up at the night sky and worry about aliens invading our small town and most certainly causing chaos, destruction, and death. I wouldn't say that this fear was informed by anything in particular, but rather representations of aliens through various TV and movies played in the 80s and 90s. My only understanding and association of a life form outside of, of life on Earth was dangerous and scary. I knew so little about aliens and therefore had a limited imagination of them and for them. But as I got older, unlike other things I was scared of, I didn't do a deep dive to learn more about aliens and face that fear. But what I did do, however, was figure out why I feared aliens and through that, what that fear did to me. Fear was and still does limit my imagination. It limits my willingness to adapt to new things and prevents me from changing. When I allowed myself to imagine beyond the death and destruction, of aliens, the fear dissipated, and in that space, the fear that was occupying, in the space that the fear was occupying, came new possibilities. And the only thing that required was my willingness to change. I changed my thinking to believe that there is, in fact, alien life forms somewhere out in the universe. And it is possible that they're not solely destructive, that there could be life forms that would come to us out of curiosity, peace, and even the possibility of generosity and help. In our planning meeting this week, I shared with Reverend Wendy that change is one of my favorite topics. It's one of my favorite things to think about, read about, and in my line of work as a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner to teach and strategize about both individually and organizationally. Because to do DEI work, whether for a job or you know, in our personal lives, uh, is to imagine, it is to dream. To imagine and dream of a world better than the one we are currently in, a world where there is such great need for change. Change not for the sake of change, but because change is all three of these things, new, necessary, and constant. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. One of the ways I wrestle and manage these three realities is by revisiting one of my all-time favorite book series, the Parable series by, by Octavia Butler. Some of you may be familiar based on the BIPOC book club, but those for those unfamiliar, this earlier quote that I just mentioned, change is God and God is change, is central to the theme of these books. The books were published five years apart, the Parable of the Sour in 1993 and the Parable of the Talents in 1998. 
and they tell the story of Lauren Oya Olimana, a young black woman living in the U.S. in the year 2024. The, in the year 2024 in the books, uh, the U.S. is beset by climate change, exacerbated capitalism, endemic extreme poverty, religious Christian fanaticism, and failed state institutions. Now, it doesn't sound that far off from our current realities, depending on how, you're, how optimistic you're feeling today or not. Um, but in these books, all of these factors are even more extreme than they are today. And it's interesting to read these books again in the year that they began, when she's told this story. They are filled with terror and destruction, and that much of the terror and the destruction that already exists in our world. And it, you can see how Octavia Butler kind of is on this trajectory, even though she wrote it a couple decades ago. Now, I'm a person that only watches rom-coms and light TV shows, and so it's always very confusing to me why I'm so drawn into these books and to these texts. But I am uh, because I'm not pulled into them to be scared into action by the terror and destruction, but rather for the blueprint of hope that she offers amidst the terror and destruction. The adaptability of the people, despite the terror and the destruction, remind me to stay imaginative of the future. We can see examples of this imagination in many places in our everyday world if we look hard enough. Any place where there is violence and destruction, there is simultaneously adaptability and hope. The books are many things, but for me, they ground me in the reality, the radicalism, and the reassurance that change is the only thing constant in our world. This doesn't mean that we are victims of it or that we don't have agency. And one of the quotes from this book that is, helps me remind me about my agency is, God is change, and in the end, God does prevail. But we have something to say about the whens and the whys of that end. We have a, way, we have a say in the way things change. And this quote reminds me to do the little actions of advocacy every week and the big actions of advocacy as much as possible to ensure democracy has a better chance in the US. Change is inevitable. Our, willing to, our willingness to participate in that change is not. Remy Paulin Tarahira, a community organizer, doctoral researcher in sociology at the London School of Economics and Political Science, writes of Octavia Butler in the parable series. Butler is interested in how, in it, Butler is interested in how human beings, especially in times of crisis, where choices are possible, but concealed by what I call the master script or the dominant narrative of the living system. People need a story that will give them long-term purpose that is complex enough to transcend their own individuality and bond them as a species. These books make me think of exactly this. The stories and other scripts we need to write and renew and discover to replace the master scripts we have inherited. The master scripts of rampant and extreme individualism need to be unlearned so that we can replace them, so that we can bond as a species and imagine possibilities of civilizations and communities beyond what we know to be possible now. The character Lauren in the book writes one of my favorite quotes. She says, civilization is to groups what intelligence is to individuals. Civilization provides ways of combining the information, experience, and creativity of the many to achieve ongoing group adaptability. Replacing extreme individualism with collectivism and an emphasis on community will help us connect and find and strengthen our adaptability. Community is what will help us navigate the change, whatever that change looks like. Change is coming. What do we need to imagine? The point then, says those philosophers, is not that everything is changing but that the fact that some things change makes possible the continued existence of other things. What do we want to make possible in this circle, in this community, in this nation? 
What do we want to continue? What is it time to let go of? What wholeness might we draw from the brokenness? What might we learn from our fear of change? How might we practice our adaptability that we might in community navigate the change, whatever that change looks like? And how might we embody Unitarian Universalism that we become alchemists, turning loneliness into connection, pain into comfort, anger into solidarity, faith into action. The subtle magic of church combines love with justice, creates hope out of fear, transforms individuals into community. May we work together to make it so. Amen. Ashe and blessed be.